classes, and, um, and a lot of you have already heard what I had to say at great length, maybe more length than you really wanted. So I thought, uh, what might be interesting? And I thought, maybe it might be interesting if I told you a little about the clarinet players that I had to do with and knew well. And also maybe a few composer stories, since we've um, commissioned so many people with our trio. So that's what I thought I would do. But first of all, we've got to thank this lady. I thank her so much. She's my very dear friend. She's my very esteemed colleague and a terrific colleague who has gone to so much trouble on my behalf, and I can't thank her enough. So. And then secondly, I want to thank all my former students who are here at yet again another one of these tribute things. Um, so many of you came to Vancouver, and here you are here, and I'm really overwhelmed. And I have to say, in 45 years, I had the most wonderful students, and you've heard a number of them already. You'll hear a great um, number, more, number more. And um, but what really is so extraordinary about them is that no matter what class they're in, they get along with each other. And they have awfully good times at conventions, by the way. If you want a good time, look for my former students. Because <laughs> they're going to they're gonna know where the good place to eat is and where the party is. And, uh, but I just got to say, I've been blessed by them all. They're just terrific. And I want to say for those five that I know that couldn't come today, there's Linda B, and Linda C, and Beth, and Kim, and Chris, who for one reason or another couldn't come, mostly because they were ill. And um, I want to say we miss them and wish they were here too. So, now let's get on to this. Um, what I thought of was some of the clarinet players who had uh, influenced me during the time, and which has been a long time, that I've been a clarinet player. And the very first one was Iggy Janusa, and he's known as Iggy, but his name was Ignatius Nicholas Janusa. And Iggy was the principal many years in uh, Baltimore, and actually would have been principal in Cleveland, but his wife Dorothy played violin, played in their first violins in Baltimore, but in Cleveland, they were going to put her in the second violins, and she didn't want that, so he stayed in Baltimore. And, um, but it would have been quite different. It would have been, instead of Marcellus, it would have been Iggy. Iggy had the most gorgeous sound. And when I first got to Brevard uh, Music Center, which was then Transylvania Music Camp, uh, Iggy played the Mozart Concerto the first week. And it was one of those, oh my god, experiences. I had no idea clarinet would sound so beautiful. And I have to say, in those days, of course, we didn't have TV then. That's how old I am. Uh, or at least my parents were the last on the block to buy one, let's put it that way. Um, you heard on the radio uh, orchestras. And really not particularly beautiful sounds. And now beautiful sounds is the way the clarinet is played today. Everybody has one. Uh, but in those days, it was rather extraordinary. And so Iggy just blew me away, as I think he did many people. And um, Iggy was also a wonderful character. You know, often we woke up with Reverly on the uh, trumpet, but then every now and then we woke up with it uh, on the clarinet. And there'd be Iggy in the really resonant dining hall at the top of the hill playing -da 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 And he also liked to get into the dining hall and play Capriccio, because you know it would reverberate all over the place. And anyway, he was just a stunning a man. And I don't know if any of you ever met him at conventions. He was there the last few years. He only died about two years ago. But he made uh, mouthpieces, and he was there in that capacity. So I went on then to Oberlin. I studied with George Wong. And one of the reasons I'm mentioning some of these people, I think you probably don't know about them anymore, and you should. George Wong at Oberlin, uh, Bill Stubbins at University of Michigan, uh, Jaime Voxman at Iowa, and Keith Wilson were kind of the clarinet teachers of the day, and they were the university teachers. There were obviously a few symphony players too, but those were really the major teachers, and those were very important people in the development of the clarinet. So I hope you'll remember those names. George Wong, for instance, was the head of NACWAPI, you know, the National Association of College Wind and Percussion Instructors. In fact, I think a founding member. He wrote the, some of the first orchestra excerpt books. He wrote a method book um, about beginning clarinet. And he didn't use my embouchure. He used the other clarinet teacher, other clarinet player that was in my class. It was was quite good, and I always felt bad about that. But I didn't have a good embouchure, <laughs> so he used hers. And, but anyway, so if you see that, uh, Anne and I are very good friends, and we always joke about the fact that her embouchure was better than mine. And she's in the method book, and I think probably some of you all have used that book. So anyway, George put me through all sorts of uh, scales, arpeggios. He was really thorough with scales and arpeggios. And I got to thinking when Maxine, uh, Marlene and um, 
Ted were talking today that um, practicing is so important in these early years. And I remember when I was at Eastman, the breakfast line opened at 7, and by God, I was there at 7. The school opened at 7.30, and I was there at 7.30. Now, I wouldn't dream of doing that now, but in those days, I really did that. And we didn't think anything of playing five or six hours a day of practicing. I mean, we just did that. Uh, I was at Eastman for five years. I don't know if I did it that religious, religiously the whole time, but certainly the first few years. And one of the reasons I did that was I sat down in the Eastman Wind Ensemble for its first rehearsal. And here's Peter Hadcock, and here is Larry Combs. Now, they've both been to Interlochen, and Pete plays one orchestra excerpt. Larry matches with a different one. And they went back and forth and back and forth. And I thought, I don't know half of those pieces, much less by memory. So that was my first job, my first year at Eastman, was to get to know what they were and then learn them. And um, so it was terrific. We were there concurrently for the four years that I was at Eastman. And we're very, very good friends. Larry then was a lanky guy. And um, Pete was uh, always a little crazy. He was wonderfully crazy. And I know some of you have read his book, The Hadcock Method. And um, he really talked like that. That's one thing I love about the book. That's the way he talked. It's really just marvelous. That's, that's really Pete. So anyhow, they were terrific colleagues. In fact, and we were all such good friends. Um, in fact, I was the uh, maid of honor at um, Peter's wedding, which goes to show was a quite showy class. And others there, Norm Heim, who taught at Maryland for years, um, Henry Miyamura, who was principal in Honolulu for years. Charlie Bay was there. So <laughs> it was quite a class. And um, we all got along really well. And so I always tried to sort of foster that in my own studio. And I think to a great extent, it worked out that well. Um, then, of course, Fennell was there, Fred Fennell. And he's a legend. Talk about legendary. Now, that's somebody who really is legendary. And when I was there, Fred had this wonderful crew cut none of this long-haired stuff that he had toward the end of his uh, career. And he'd come in just bursting with energy, and he would jump onto a podium, and he'd get started. And it was just wonderful to work with him. And the nice thing about him, he treated us as though we were colleagues. He didn't act like he was a conductor, we were the, the peons, but uh, we were all in this thing together. And that would, group would change a quarter or a third of the personnel um, every year. And somehow or another, he would get it to the same standard year after year after year. So he was just terrific, and um, we all really liked him. I remember he loaned me some money. He also tried to get me to buy his MG, but my mother wouldn't let him sell it to me. <laughs> she thought I'd kill myself in that car, and she was probably right. But uh, he had this MG I really coveted. But in any case, he was just terrific. And then, of course, Stanley Hasty. It's so hard to even know where to begin about Stanley Hasty. Um, all of us that studied with him just loved him and still do, and thank God he's still here with us. In fact, they're going to have in Ohio State a um, convention sort of centered around him and his former students at the end of April. And I recommend going to see this man in action. He's going to do a few master classes. And um, uh, what can I say about him? He was a lot of fun, was a, maybe the first thing I think about. And I think of sitting next to the orchestra next to him for three years as second clarinet. <clears throat> and he and his best friend, David Van Hosen, were always having a good time. They were discussing the making of beer, which they were much into at that point. They were discussing all sorts of things, very rarely about music. And um, they said if you were in the string section, you'd look back there, and there'd be this grim row of flutes and clarinets, right? And then you'd look back, and there's this smiling, happy group of clarinets and bassoons. And that was because of Hasty and Van Hosen. And um, so that kind of sticks in my mind. I mean, that's the sort of uh, fellow he was. I remember him leaning down, and now I understand, too. He'd kind of groan when he'd go down to pick up his case. And I thought, my goodness. But I do that all the time now, too. I begin to understand things about old age. Another thing I never understood is how come he couldn't keep his lessons on time? And then I started to teach, and I realized, you can't do that. You know, you just can't teach an hour. You've got to go. When the lesson ends, it ends. And, um, but uh, the main thing I think that was so wonderful about him was the way he dealt in principles. And at the time, I didn't realize that. I was really not terribly bright in those days. I, and maybe I still am not. 
but um, I didn't really understand how that's what he was doing, and they were going in here. And by the time I started teaching, after a while I realized it's just one principle after another that I basically heard from Stanley Hasty. And then, of course, obviously you end up with your own system. But um, to me, that's the really important thing. And what he did, and I didn't know that either at that time, he sort of taught you how to teach yourself. And um, that, to me, has become just the guiding uh, light of my teaching. I want to be able to make it so clear so that when the students leave my studio, they know what to go out to do in practice, and they know how to tackle, and I can go into that later in much more detail, how to tackle new pieces as well as problems that they have. So uh, it all sort of stemmed from Stanley Hasty, and there's hardly a day when I'm teaching that I don't mention his name once or twice. And I find that kind of extraordinary, too. I couldn't tell you exactly how he taught any interpretation except a few things. He took offense with my uh, two, two large retards and Brahms E-flat. I remember that very specifically. Uh, I can remember so many things that he mentioned. Uh, but you know, it wasn't really about play like I want you to play, but you should understand this principle and this principle and that principle. And uh, that's really become a, a guiding force in my teaching, and I can't thank him enough from it, for it. <clears throat> but mostly, he was also just a lot of fun. And another person who was a lot of fun was Harold Wright, who at Marlboro was known as Buddy Wright. He was there, I was there for four uh, summers, at about the same time Dick Stolzman was, by the way. And we both switched to the double lip around the same time, and I suspect because of Harold Wright's influence. And um, I think one of the things that stands out to me about Harold is you drive down the road into Marlboro, and he lived in the little red house. And you'd go by that little red house in your car, and you could always hear clarinet playing coming out of there, because the man was always practicing. Now, I think that tells us something, doesn't it? The man practiced a lot. And, um, and you know the little chromatic study I have for you? Da -da 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 that was from Harold Wright. One morning he came in, it was a 9 o'clock rehearsal. He came in at one minute before 9 had been late, he usually was well on time for rehearsals, and he did and then and he did that exercise, and um, that's made its way into my finger exercises, if you may recall that, I'm sure many of you vividly recall my <laughs> finger exercises. <clears throat> but in any case, um, nice thing about Harold, other than the fact that he was just a beautiful player, he was, as I say, a really approachable, nice person. Uh, every summer, uh, I'd just say, could we just get together and talk about clarinet? And I'd ask him questions, and one thing would lead to another, and it'd be three or four hours, uh, and of course, no fee. He was also the person who introduced me to snails, and I remember that vividly, too. It was at Marlboro, the concerts were Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon. And it was sort of a tense situation. You had to be really good, and everybody had to be good, no matter how famous or not famous. And um, they were always reviewed by the Boston Globe and the New York Times. So by Sunday night, people were ready to let loose. And um, sometimes you'd go out to dinner. And that time, I went out with, with Harold and his wife, uh, Ruth, and a few others. And so he said, here's the way you open the snails. And he grabbed a snail, and he started to show it, and it just went across the room. And that was my first experience with snails, was watching Buddy Wright toss a snail. You know, I don't know if you've done that, but you know, the spring action, if you don't have it just right, it's going to fly. And it did. And um, so he just giggled, and we went on. And, uh, but also, then sometimes after those concerts, we'd um, just stay at the college, Marlboro College. And um, the ladies, there were so many wonderful ethnic people there. We had all sorts of different meals, Jewish meals, Spanish meals, you name it, French. Um, the ladies, uh, the husbands, uh, wives usually, of the um, uh, participants would cook a meal. And so we'd stay. And then afterward, there'd be some activity. Well, one night there was square dancing. So everybody's in their group of eight, about five groups. And um, things are moving right along. And then in comes Buddy Wright. And he first goes into one group of eight, and suddenly there are nine, and disrupts that group. Then he runs into the next group, same thing, disrupts that. And eventually the whole thing just ground to a halt. <laughs> and, I mean, that was the sort of thing he would do. And I remember that time, Benita Valenti, uh, quite a famous soprano, lived there at that time. And I can still hear her saying, oh, buddy. And uh, everybody just loved it. So um, he, uh, there are other stories I could tell you about him too, but I think I won't. Um, but at Marlboro, they're, um, well, no, they're all okay. I just, <laughs> um, at Marlboro, there was always a sort of sense of fun, and it was, um, 
I think it started because Rudolf Serkin had a marvelous sense of humor, a wonderful pianist, Rudolf Serkin, one of the greats of the last century. And he and Moise together founded the Marlboro Festival in, I think, 51. And um, um, I was there the last time that both Moise and uh, Serkin were together, and then I guess they had a little falling out. But in any case, it was fantastic. Um, everybody um, sort of, I don't know, let loose at dinner time. And for some reason, it was throwing wadded up napkins and rolls. Now, you're not gonna get a good impression of Marlborough from this, but in any case, Serkin was a master. And he would wad up something, he'd toss it over there, and then he'd just be talking to somebody as though he hadn't done anything. So everybody learned to do that. And um, so we did a lot of that, too. It was really childish when you think about it. And that's why I'm not gonna tell you any more <laughs> Marlborough studies. But uh, it really was a magnificent place to go. The idea was that the young people, at which time I was born, um, and the older professionals would work together and the enthusiasm of the youth and the experience of the older people would all come together in marvelous music, music making, which I must say it did. It was just amazing to hear those uh, concerts there. Uh, when I was there, for instance, Casals was there and um, of course Serkin and members of the Budapest Quartet. My first experience with a large group with Moise conducting, I was playing principal Buddy Wright was behind me in a Mozart serenade for 13 wins. He was playing basset horn. Here's John Mack, the principal oboe of Cleveland Orchestra. I was just scared to death. But it worked out okay. And um, John Barrows, I don't know if you know that name. But I mean, these were just major, wonderful woodwind players. And it was a terrific time to be there. So that was the 60s. Now, uh, <laughs> and then <clears throat> I did come here. And I can't say enough good things about Keith Stein as a person and colleague. He was such a hard worker. He would be here every day at 8. He taught 8 to 12, five days a week, but then he'd go home. That was enough. <laughs> you know? And he once said that. He said, do your work, but then leave the school. And I never was smart enough to do that. <laughs> and, um, but in any case, uh, he was just, uh, again, I, I didn't mention him earlier. He was, of course, in that group with Stubbins and Keith Wilson and uh, Vachman and George Wong was, of course, Keith Stein. And um, <clears throat> some of the people that are here, like Jimmy, worked with him. Uh, Bob, where's Bob? Bob yeah. did too, yeah. And um, then I came. <laughs> and I think Bob put it best when he said, you were a tyrant, <laughs> right? You remember that? And Bob is one of my best friends now. But I was a little tough. I don't know who I thought it was. I think the main thing was I was so close to their age that I thought I should be tough. I don't know. In any case, um, Bob was able to stick it out with me, though, and uh, so we're fast friends today. But um, that was um, a wonderful time to be here when Keith was here. So that's kind of a uh, just rough uh, survey of some of the people that influenced me a lot and with whom I had a really close and wonderful relationship. So then I thought what I'd do is maybe talk about some of the composers we've commissioned unless somebody wants to stop and ask some questions now, or you want to leave, let's see what time we got. My goodness, it's only three minutes after two. Uh oh, <laughs> Marlene, that's trouble. <laughs> yes? Um, well, <clears throat> there are a bunch of them, and uh, you know what I really always want to do is write an article about them, and I keep forgetting to do that, but one day I think I will. I tried to get him to, and he just thought it was too much trouble. But um, well, one of the things that's, uh, some of them are so simple, and I can't really take them off the top of my head, to be honest, but um, one is the echo effect. In the Mozart Concerto, the first movement, when the exposition is finished and the development starts, you know, where there's a, it goes, and then eventually, well, he said, make a crescendo. Don't just play it louder. Make a crescendo. Then the second time, play it absolutely pianissimo with no crescendo, and it'll work, and it does. And that, that I think, is a wonderful thing for the echo effect. That way, uh, it just heightens the uh, uh, contrast. Um, another thing he spent a lot of time about was articulation. Okay, Brahms E flat second movement. This is where I'll always remember that, and I've since then, and it was a principle there that was applied so often. Um, you know, you go ta di da 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 and then at the, uh, it's an ABA. Do you know that first section on the page is an ABA? I spent a lot of time talking about form because it's really important that second A 
is much more so than the first day. So anyway, tea, and then it goes ta tia da 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 tia 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 tum tia tum tia tum. Well, I was just playing it the way you ordinarily would. Ta da tia tum tia tum tia tum. And he said, No, you've got to point out by the way you use your tongue, point out those phrases. It changes into a sort of a hemiola thing. And as I've gone through music, I keep realizing how often it's not just an articulation. It really is a phrasing. And so I spend a lot of time mentioning that to my students as well. So that was a principle that started there. And it wasn't as though he said, this is a big principle, but I began to see how it kept on returning. And so there were a lot of things like that. And if I could think of another one, I would. But right now, <laughs> I can't. Um, but a lot of things like that that he would teach that just made such sense. And you thought, well, that really totally clarifies that um, passage. And so it's things like that. And I really will every now and then when, you know, when you're actually teaching, all these things come out that you just don't do off the top of your head when you start to think, OK, I should really write these down. Now, what are they? And But so I started, and I haven't done it enough. While I'm teaching, one of these things comes up, I would write it down for a while. But I haven't done that lately, and I must start doing that again. But anyway, I would love to articulate Hasty's principles. I'd like to talk to Larry uh, Combs about that as well, and maybe we can come up with why Hasty meant so much to us. But so, any other? Why did you switch to the double lip? Why did I switch to the double lip? Well, I'll tell you, it was a review in the New York Times. They said the clarinet player was very musical, but she had a, a rather thin sound. And I thought, thin sound, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was on a Marlboro tour. We did 13 con uh, I was. It was with Murray Pariah. Murray Pariah, this wonderful pianist, was 19 at the time. Leslie Parnas and a violinist, uh, Hiroko Yajima, who's the wife of Sammy Rhodes of the um, Juilliard Quartet. So we played the Hinnemouth Quartet and then the Beethoven Trio, and then they did a cello sonata. And, um, I had been, of course, at Marlboro, and I'd heard Harold Wright. And what really, uh, the smoothness with which he negotiated the registers and, and the sound. And I have to admit, that was an influence. I'm sure Dick Stolson would say the same thing. <coughs> but somehow, I always had known, even before that nasty review, that uh, I would probably change, because I didn't feel like I was getting the bottom of the sound somehow. somehow. And I have to say, um, for me, it's been really good, but I don't make my students do it unless they want to try it. And then some people can go back and forth. I can't go back and forth. I play exclusively double lip. I can more or less stand to play, but I don't. And fortunately, in the trio, you don't stand. And uh, so anyway, I just found that it uh, was perhaps the best teacher I had of all. When I started to play double lip, suddenly the sound spread like that. So I had to start using my ear better. And what they said about air today, the number of times I've written on my students' uh, music, air, 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 you know, like location, location, location. And um, but so I had to do that. I, have, I didn't know what I was doing. And actually, Harold wrote me a really nice letter that I have not been able yet to find, but I know I will when I clean up the aftermath of what I took from my studio home, um, and saying a few things that were very helpful. And um, so it took me a long time to get the exact grip of that. And, uh, but then because of that, then my tongue was lower in my mouth, so I had to sort of redo my tonguing a little bit. So I had to think about how I played the clarinet in every way, and particularly the holding of the clarinet, which as everybody knows a big, uh, that studies with these, is a big thing. It's all right here on the, the right bone of the thumb. And um, so I learned how to do that so that the clarinet more or less held itself. I learned how to use these muscles. I started using my air better. I changed my way of tonguing. And that was when I began to realize I had to come to grips with all these things 12 years after I started teaching here. Why shouldn't I make sure that I'm very clear with my students every thing with embouchure, air, et cetera. And that's where all my exercises came from. And that's where my organized, I'd like to think, organized approach to the physical side of playing came from. It was all because of the double lip. So. And how long did it take you to switch over? Oh, a uh, long time. <laughs> you know, I remember Buddy said that about the double lip, too. He says, the wonderful thing about it is it keeps getting better. And you know, it still does to this day. I find that it, uh, it gets better. Um, it's a good thing, because when things start going worse, then you're in trouble. And I'm just really worried about that day. <laughs> but so far, so good. Um, but in any case, uh, that's why I switched, because I really hadn't felt satisfied with my sound. And I found it was rewarding, because it showed me all the things I really needed to do better. So. 
Okay, so let me just say a few things about some of our composers, but first I want to say something about the trio, because the trio accidentally mushroomed and grew into something that we never expected, but we're delighted with. Um, it's violin, clarinet, and piano, as I hope you know, and um, we started it, obviously, because Walter and I were married, and we played for a while the first uh, three or three years, the major pieces, and it was Bartok, Stravinsky, Krennic, uh, Berg, Mio, um, and they were fine pieces, and we do trio, sonata, trio, sonata, trio. But then after a while, we realized we just couldn't play those pieces for the rest of our lives, or at least I thought that. So I started to commission, and I got Carol Husa and Leslie Bassett and Ned Roram and Thea Musgrave, and those were some of our early people. And then Walter started taking it over, and he's continued, and so he really has um, by far done the most uh, of the commissionings. And he has this uncanny knack for understanding that this person is going to become well known sometime because he's talented. We got Bright Chang before Bright Chang became so big. And any number of people, we were talking, who else were we mentioning today? Who? Reem, yeah, Reem, and anyway, lots of people. And um, so now we have well over 200 works. And the astounding thing is, so many of those are really good. And as we say in our publicity blurb, we have young and old, uh, well known and not known, and uh, all the various contrasts. But really, I, I'd say there are about maybe 25 not so good pieces in the repertoire, but so many of them are outstanding. And we have tried to record the ones that um, we think are the most outstanding. We're up to CD 18 and 19 we're working on now. And um, the other thing is we're doing DVDs. Again, Walter's creation, not mine. Um, and the DVDs are fantastic because we just play like the Bobby Mann first violinist, the Juilliard Quartet, wrote a piece for us. It's about 12 minutes long. So we play that. And then the rest of this hour is the most fascinating 45 minutes of talk by Bobby Mann, who knew everybody from Elliot Carter to Copeland and his story about the Schoenberg Quartet. They went to play for Schoenberg in California. It's all in there. And um, I don't mean that you need to buy them personally, but any time that you're associated with a library, you really ought to have those just to hear those people talk. And he shows us a Kokoschka thing that they were drinking scotch heavily one night, and Kokoschka kept balling up things and throwing it away, but finally there was one he liked. He signed it. It's hanging on Bobby's wall. And David Diamond, same thing. You go into David Diamond's apartment on our DVD, and um, here's a picture of Greta Garbo, who he got to know, and Debussy, letter from Ravel. I mean, you know, it's just an amazing uh, collection of the things that meant something to him. <clears throat> and the photographer just went around and he talks about them. So that's one thing we're trying to do now, is to have the composers talk about their pieces on DVDs. And we've got Joan Tower and Libby Larson, and of course the two we just mentioned, and John Carlo Monati. Now that was a storyteller beyond all. He was just, um, so many wonderful stories. Again, and th I think we had to have two DVDs for him <laughs> because he had so many wonderful stories. So that's what we're trying to do is, in a sense, um, I don't know, just put down for historical purposes the best people uh, that we can afford to, <laughs> to record. And I think uh, it's a major contribution, not taking any credit for ourselves, but it's sort of mushroomed. We've gotten a lot of grants. Michigan State has been very helpful. So I wish you'd look into that. It's called The Making of the Medium. We modestly called it. And, um, but it's under verdere.com. And uh, the, some of the repertoire, really a lot of people playing. Maxine Ramey has a group like ours who's doing a lot of uh, playing of these pieces and pieces that they are commissioning themselves. We just heard from a group from France this week, from uh, England last week. It's just amazing how many people are starting up because they see Warham and they see Minotti and they see all these names that they know and they're interested in <coughs> hearing about them. Well, let me tell you a Minotti story. So we went to do this DVD. We went to his castle in Scotland. And there you get served breakfast in bed. The, the waiters come upstairs, because he really, honestly, God lives in a castle. And you drive down this long road, and here are two gate posts. And then there's a lake, and then there's this castle. And um, so we stayed on the second floor, and we did the recording in his ballroom. We ate with Ro Happy Rockefeller, who was his, um, not daughter-in-law, but um, the daughter-in-law's mother. Uh, in one dining room, and then there's another dining room here. I mean, it's a castle. And um, so that was just wonderful, and we have the thing filmed in the study where he wrote a lot of his operas plus our piece. 
So <clears throat> again, just for historical purposes, that's very interesting. I think he tells a story about the chandelier too. When um, they sold the castle to him, the people wanted to take the chandelier. And the workman there said, no, no, you can't have the chandelier. The castle's always had that. But they wanted to take the chandelier. So the day they came to get it, the chandelier mysteriously just dropped on the floor, broke into a million pieces. But it was like the chandelier wasn't going to leave that castle. Now, of course, someone might have loosened the screw. <laughs> but I don't think so, and Monati swears he didn't <laughs> in any case. Um, but you should hear his stories. Oh, for instance, when he and Sam Barber rode across the lake to go visit um, um, Toscanini. And they got to the door, and what it seemed like a great idea at the time didn't seem like a good idea then. So when the doorman answered, they said, is Mrs. Toscanini there? And the, the butler said, no, but would you like to speak to the maestro? And they said, oh, OK. And then they spent the rest of the afternoon there, and they got to know Toscanini very well. But uh, at first, it was sort of like, no, no, let's give it to Mikey. You know, let him, let him try. <laughs> and, um, and it started, sort of, well, like, for instance, in the telephone, apparently there's a time when you are to give a certain number. And um, apparently, they changed the number to the mistress of Toscanini so that when that moment arrived in the opera and the telephone was like that, there was a squeal from the mistress because she was amazed at her telephone number. <laughs> and you know, just one story after another um, of all sorts. Uh, really, just the most wonderful man. And that piece, um, talk about some of them were hard to, to get. Um, he finished the romanza a full 10 years after Walter first asked him to write for us. And Walter did a TV interview with him then, and then uh, about 10 years later for this DVD. So he got the first one to us in October of 95. Uh, and then we went on. We, it was in the Carlisle Hotel. He served us a beautiful full breakfast in the Carlisle Hotel in New York. Some of these people knew how to live. And then we went on and came back, um, and it turned out he had a terrible fall in December. Couldn't uh, finish a piece, we thought. We thought that's going to be it, because he had to have brain surgery. But in March, all of a sudden, appears the first movement. And then he says, come to Spoleto this summer and play. We'll do the world premiere there. I'll get the third movement to you. So it gets to be June. July 7th is the date. It gets to the end of June. And he says, oh, I'll have it ready for you when you get here. It's, um, my music is not hard. So we thought, fine, and got there. And of course, it wasn't finished, and it wasn't then. But we had arranged, it was his 85th birthday, to have a concert here at MSU. And um, so he was coming for that. He said, I'll bring the third movement then. And we said, could you send it early? But no, he said, I'll bring it. So he gets here, and he doesn't have it finished. He says, it's all up here, but uh, I forgot my glasses at home, so I couldn't write it out on the plane. OK, so Walter takes him to Pearl Vision to get him some glasses. <laughs> Uh, and um, so that was Friday morning. The concert was Saturday night. And some of you all may have been here for that concert. And um, as a result, he um, uh, was working away at it. And he'd finish a page, and we go Xerox, and I'd write it out in my key. And by noon the next day, he put the final chords on it. And so then we rehearsed it and um, played it for him. And then we played it that night. And now that was for us, I gotta say. But anyway, we got the completed piece, and it's just terrific. Uh, and many, many people have played that. So uh, Ned Warren also took a long time. On the other hand, Al Alan Hovannis did it in six months. And I was telling Mike Norsworthy, who knows the music of Wolfgang Reed, who's a very prominent, if not the most prominent composer right now in Europe, it took about 14 years to get the piece out of him. But that was one of the people that Walter identified early as being an important talent. So it's a really long piece, two, 26 minutes, sort of, excuse me, sort of Schoenbergian. And, but anyway, so um, there is that, I told, yeah. And then William Balcom, I don't, you know that he's written a clarinet concerto, of course, and he's written us a trio. Um, and so we're doing a DVD of his work, too. Um, and a friend of his named Arnie Black was writing a piece for us and died during the composing of it. So he sent us the fragments from, his wife sent us the fragments from his computer. Walter was going down to see Bill to get an uh, interview with him. And while he was there, he said, um, you know, I have these fragments from Arnie Black. Would you know anybody who would be able to finish it? Well, Arnie and uh, Bill were very good friends. And Bill said, no, I don't know, but I'll, I can't do it. I'm too busy, but I'll see if I get it done. Well, the minute Walter left, apparently he went to work on it. And overnight, he worked on it. He finished it the next day, called us up and said, I finished the movement. So we played it then with him at the piano. 
uh, at um, the New York Memorial Concert for uh, Arnie. And I just thought that was so wonderful of Bill. He, he just did that because he loved Arnie and because he's really a nice person. And we know Peter Shickley quite well. There's another really brilliant, nice person. Uh, and there's so many composers, I don't know if I want to bore you with any more. I think I'll bore you with one more, because many of you have played Eva Gutkowski's piece, right? Uh, she's written two concertos and other uh, various pieces. And Eda is this small, intense, black-haired lady with sparkling eyes, totally in contrast to her taller, uh, larger, blonde-headed violinist sister. And they lived in France during the war came uh, the time when bombers uh, were overhead going to bomb in Germany, going back over France, got shot down. Ida would jump on her bike, she was eight, would jump on her bike, drive to uh, find where the par parachuter had gone down, who had parachuted out of the plane, and then would bring her back to their farmhouse where they hid them until they could get the prisoners to the French resistance who then spirited them across um, the uh, channel. Uh, and to hear her tell it too, it's kind of bone chilling um, because they had a radio transmitter in their house so they could be in touch with the resistance. And many is the time, apparently the Nazis came by and one time they almost found a prisoner in the house and once they almost found the um, radio transmitter. And it turned out they almost were turned in. Just as the war ended, somebody had squealed on them and they were about to be taken away. They happened to be uh, uh, French but, and Jewish, and fortunately the war ended. So when she tells that story, I mean, you have chills just walking up and down your spine, but um, so she did her bit, and um, she's just the most wonderful, dramatic, dynamic person, and as you that know her concerto know, that's her music as well. So that's Ida. I always remember about her mother, too. They always had cats, and the cats were just crawling up and down her leg, and her stockings had all these rips. And, you know, certain things you just never forget. And that's one that I never forgot. So, but um, that pretty much summarizes what I can say. I, I thought I would stop these stories when people got rested. And um, so I don't know if anybody's rested yet or not, but that's probably enough. So how about some questions, Bob? Also, why don't you talk a little bit